God, our Father, we thank you so much for this day. God, we're gathered in this, your house, God, to mm. assemble ourselves as servants of yours to not only share what you've blessed us to do, but God, to gain insight further as we endeavor to maximize our resources, to encourage and aid our parishioners. Yes. God, help us in this day to be all that this was desired and designed for it to be according to your will. Have your way in this place. God. Yes, Lord. I pray that you will bring to our remembrance everything that you want us to share. It's in the precious and powerful name of Jesus we Jesus. pray. Amen and thank you. Amen. Welcome to uh, the pews in the pandemic. We have a panel of pastors today at the Greater Pure Light Missionary Baptist Church where Reverend Dr. Daryl Broussard serves as the senior pastor. Uh, we wanted to create a space opportunity for these pastors to discuss what it looks like uh, to pastor during a pandemic. We realize that the pandemic has, that was created by COVID-19, has left church buildings uh, virtually shuttered for the first time in recent history. Not since the 1918 flu pandemic have churches been instructed by government authorities to modify their services. So for the first time in history, the church in America, online worship and programming has been the norm since mid-March of this year, 2020. And in the words of Stanford economist Paul Romer, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. To any outsider, there are few, if any, churches which are wasting this time. In fact, most pastors and church leaders are working overtime to learn new skills like live streaming and video editing, as well as engaging people of at least five different generations, not all of whom are digital natives. While we have settled into a sort of normalcy or a different kind of normal, if you will, during this pandemic, what can churches do now to begin to ask and answer the right questions? strategically plan and consider how they will restart programming when the social distancing restrictions are relaxed or if they're ever lifted altogether. At the outset of the shutdown in North America, many pastors' first goal was to ensure their people felt embraced with love and care. Of course, the need for hope has always been there. Forms of suffering that long predated the onslaught of COVID-19 they have not stopped. People still have cancer, marriages still collapse, and sin still crushes. Hear what Ephesians 4, verse 11 through 13 says. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Today we are gathered and joined with the Northeast Levites. They are an aggregation of senior pastors who serve in the Northeast vicinity of Houston, Texas. And it's a fellowship and a brotherhood that uh, prays together, who holds each other accountable uh, through personal life and ministry. Today they've invited us in and allowed us to be a part of their intimate setting, sacrificing their already busy schedules to discuss what it looks like to pastor through a pandemic. Uh, I personally pray that we all can lean in and learn from them and pray along with them as they have the responsibility of leading and being the under shepherds of their local churches and leading their homes and their families. Uh, before we begin, I'll let Pastor Barry introduce himself and tell you uh, who the North Le Levites are and what they represent. Thank you, uh, Brother Stefan. I appreciate the opportunity, man, to just sit and allow you to moderate. I'm excited just hearing that introduction. Um, as you stated, the Northeast Levite is a group of pastors who come together on a weekly basis. Tuesday mornings at 630, man, we are praying not only for each other, but we are praying for our spouses, our children, our congregations, issues that are facing us on a weekly basis. The Levites was birthed out of a, a hunger of mine that 
Pastors have somebody they can lean on. Pastors have somebody they can talk to, somebody they can trust. Uh, we have to absorb our congregants' uh, issues and the things that they wrestle with spiritually, uh, emotionally, even physically. And a lot of that we have to keep to ourselves. But at a certain point, we need someone as well um, that we can lean on, somebody who has our best interests at heart, who's not going to share what they've heard against us uh, to anyone else um, in a non-profitable manner. Um, but that's what we do. Once a month, the last Friday of each month, man, we get together and have fellowship, break bread. But, man, we've cried together, and uh, I'm, I'm – I'm almost watering in my eyes now just thinking about some of the instances that we've had uh, where we've prayed for one another and how God has synchronized our lives whereby the experience of one brother somehow or another becomes the reality of the other soon thereafter. And we have that to lean on. We have that to glean from. And uh, it's been a real joy. We are not a recruiting organization. We are not uh, a ministry that is... Uh, anyone come, whosoever we have known. We attempt to vet individuals uh, before they come into this group because sensitive subject matter is discussed in these groups. And so uh, I'm appreciative. I'm also thankful uh, to our bivocational pastors as well. Uh, they don't always get the opportunity to come to our meetings, but uh, Pastor Hector took off time, man, to yeah. be a part of this <coughs> today. And that means much. And he always is willing to assist wherever he can be served or be utilized, but uh, glad he was able to be here today, man. Uh, but that's who we are, man. That's who we are. They call me prayers, but all of them, man. They, 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 I, I'm, well, I used to be the baby of the bunch. I used to, I ain't the baby of the bunch. <laughs> I'm Pastor Theophilus Berry of the Greater True Light Missionary Baptist Church, 6828 Annunciation Street, Houston, Texas. I've been serving as the senior pastor now for a little over 16 years. Uh, God has blessed, and I'm appreciative that there are some people still following. J.D. Dinkins, pastor at the Blessed Hope Baptist Church, 3741 Colvin Street, off of Wallaceville Road, been pastoring eight years, and grateful to be able to serve God in his kingdom. I'm Pastor Darrell Broussard, pastor of the Greater Pure Light Church. Um, 12330 Vickery. Certainly grateful to be a part of uh, this Levite community. Uh, I've pastored this church 33 plus years. It'll be 34 years in November. Uh, good morning. My name is Darren Porat, pastor of the True Line Missionary Baptist Church in Spring, Texas. Um, Old Town Spring, to be more precise. 27307 Oak Street, Spring, Texas. Amen. Lee Skinner, pastor of Good Shepherd Baptist Church. Um, we're in a place called Sedegas, Texas. I've uh, been there, I'll be 30 years this coming December. And uh, again, grateful to God to be able to be a servant of uh, the people of the Good Shepherd Church. Greetings, Danny Hector. I am proud, privileged pastor, New Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church, located in the Fifth Ward section of our city. I've been a member there since. 87. I've been pastoring there for 50 years. Uh, Ken Campbell, pastor of the Household of Faith Community Church on Titwell, 6302 Titwell to be exact. I'm a Northeast Houston native, born and raised in Fifth Ward, City Gas, Lakewood, and so I'm privileged to serve with these pastors in this area. Pastor D.R.O. Lewis of the Great Old Grove Baptist Church in 9829 Sanders Street. I also was educated in the North Forest School District, so it's good to be pastoring at home. I actually have the privilege of pastoring the church I actually was baptized in at the age of seven. Hey Amen. We thank God again for each and every one of these pastors. Uh, before we get into the listing of questions, I do want to thank uh, this media team, as we already said, this, this, this host of a pastor, uh, all of those who are behind the scenes making uh, this day possible. We'll start with Pastor Barry, uh, and the first question for you, Pastor, is how are you meeting the spiritual, emotional <coughs> needs of your parishioners who are not active in the church since we are not meeting in person? Thank you. Um, to meet the spiritual needs of our church, I have con 
continued some practices and have also had to implement some practices. Prior to the pandemic, we would um, utilize our, uh, our Facebook page. We would also use our prayer line simultaneously to cover each of them in prayer twice a week and do periodic devotionals. Uh, we would use also our one call now to send messages. Now, however, <laughs> man, since the third Sunday in March, I've used our public Facebook page to do our Sunday broadcast and our private page to do our devotional snap, which is spiritual nourishment and prayer, Monday through Saturday at noon. To meet their emotional needs, we still have our tribe leaders in place to be the first line of ministry accountability. I'm always accessible in uh, special cases, though. Yeah. And thank you, Pastor Barry. Uh, second question. As we know, uh, since the, the, the close of in-person worship, uh, Zoom has been a very popular option for most churches. Uh, but children and teenagers need physical and personal contact. How would the re-imaging of, or how would that re-imagine our ministries now? And how are you engaging your children and youth? Man, listen, Zoom is popular, but I'm getting familiar with it on the fly. The latter part of May or early part of June, um, I had the privilege of doing bubbles with my babies. Man, that was a very, very great um, outlet for me. I think I got more kick out of it than they did. Um, now the next groups, I have relied on our youth department and one of our ministers to help me with that. We've talked about doing gaming challenges to keep the boys um, connected with each other because our church is unique in this sense that we exist in a community that most of our congregants migrate to. And so they come from a, a variety of places. And so social media is their best friend now. Um, our girls, we are doing cooking things with them. They have Netflix nights with their mentors. Uh, but it's evolving. It's evolving. Um, I'm also planning to give them opportunities to volunteer doing our distribution. Uh, when we give away the goods at the church twice a month. So that's what we are trying to do. First question for you, Pastor Broussard, is how or have you made any adjustments or alterations to your sermon prep and delivery? Well, um, not necessarily. I, well, I guess I can answer it in this, in this way. Um, I put a lot into my sermon preparation even before the pandemic, um, I find myself now, you know, when we first started this, you know, you couldn't have anybody in the, in the sanctuary. It was just my praise team and my production team. And I was telling them, you know, hey, I need y'all to keep it, keep it hush. Don't, don't, don't talk, don't do it. And so I'm preaching to this church and ain't nobody responding to me. And so God quickly changed that thing. And so I said, since y'all here, let's have church. And so um, <clears throat> whereas I used to preach maybe 35 to 40 minutes before the pandemic, I've discovered I can preach a full sermon in about 25 to 30 minutes. And so that has changed and uh, will we'll also uh, be the case when this pandemic is over with. Uh, I won't be preaching 30 and 40, I mean 35, 40 and 50 minute sermons. And so in terms of preparation, same preparation, I, I've dug a little deeper and uh, it, it's paying off for us. We, we, we are here in Houston, Texas and a lot of times when you hear uh, cases of social injustice and things that happen in our city with politics and they reach out to clergymen or religious leaders, a lot of times you see some of the, the same faces when it comes to, to clergy. Uh, in regards to social and political issues, how can more pastors come together and have a seat at the table, if you will, and have a voice rather than there being a divide? Because officials need to know their our needs from all communities and not just from certain pastors or known clergymen. That, that's one of the unique things about this particular group. Um, it, it's not about 
big names. Um, I'm, I'm very confident in who I am, and so I don't measure me by the status of another pastor. And a lot of pastors want it to be all about them. They want the limelight. They want everything to be centered around them. Uh, in this particular ministry, these brothers, we come together. And I don't consider us as little pastors. I consider us as pastors. And we do the jobs that we're supposed to do. And uh, when we're not accepted by those who are quote-unquote bigger-named pastors, we don't trip about it. We do what we've been called to do. And uh, we've had good success um, with everything that, that God has just given us favor with everything that uh, we, we've, we've undertaken to do. And so as far as the divide is concerned, there's no division in this group. We go forth, we minister, we serve. Uh, as Pastor Barry said, we cry together, we laugh together, we eat together, we serve together. And so uh, we've been able to reach <clears throat> many outlets as far as making our voice known, not just in Northeast Houston, but Levites of Northeast Houston are known all, all around Houston because we come together and we work together as a unit, as brothers. And so it's not Pastor Barry is going to stand out front or Pastor Moore is going to stand out front. We stand together. And so when we're not accepted by others, it's okay. We still do what we do because it's about God getting the glory and not about our personal story. Well, we'll shift now to Dr. Ken Campbell of the Household of Faith Community Church. Uh, how would you say uh, your spouse or a, a, a first lady can be helpmates and partners in ministry during this, this time and this season? Thank you for that question. Um, in our ministry, my wife, uh, fortunately, is the lead facilitator of our women's ministry. Uh, we call it the WOW ministry, Women of Wholeness. And uh, I remember asking them once, what has happened or where has the WOW in WOW gone? <laughs> and so uh, they took that challenge years ago and really began to be a more prayer-serving group, ministering group, and they are really aggressive about uh, following up with members and checking on members. They lead prayer times a couple of times a week. Uh, they join in with the general church prayer schedule as well as they have time for women to minister one to another. So I think in this time where there's no social gathering, they participate in Zoom activities to encourage one another and they do a lot of uh, follow-up and prayer covering uh, the needs and issues of our congregation very well. So in terms of that... Um, wives can find a place in ministry because truthfully at this time it seems like not much action is going on other than the preacher doing his responsibilities of sharing the word and then the band and the, maybe a few worship leaders and the media crew but other ministries I've been working on ways in our church to keep them engaged and so yeah, that's a good question our, our women are very active my wife leads that ministry and uh, I'm proud of the effort they're putting forward would you say at the household of faith community church within the scope of your leadership is stepping up in this crisis and demonstrating leadership skills <laughs> wow that's a good question because uh, I'll be honest initially uh, it felt like such a lonely road as if everything fell on my shoulders um, but I have uh, one particular deacon uh, in mind that really has not missed a beat and then other ministries are now finding ways where they can continue to do their work because uh, you may ask the question what can an usher do you're not seating anybody but I actually have ushers that show up and maintain the doors and facilities they help in you know uh, cleaning the mics and transitioning and things like that so there are ways to serve and then the staff that does come to do the live broadcast uh, they may want to give their offerings, or the ushers are helping in that regard as well. But I've got um, a good small core of leaders who have <clears throat> came and said, what can we do, and just found any little thing to do to serve and participate to keep it going. So I'm, I'm encouraged by that, yeah. But, and it's difficult at this time to find things for them to do because, you know, it, our, our ministry is sort of limited and narrow in focus right now. Mostly everything is just 
preparing for our broadcast and then, you know, the behind the scenes work that needs to go. So um, I've got one deacon in mind and then a couple of other leaders that have really been stepped up. And then our, our band and music department haven't missed a beat. So. Uh, Pastor Dinkins, uh, how do you handle that now? How do you handle premarital counseling and, and, and weddings and funerals and baby dedications and hospital visitations uh, since we are not able to be in person as we normally would. Well, we grew up in an era. I was not a generational preacher, but I watched preachers. And those preachers were always very hands-on. They showed up uh, when people didn't expect them to show up. So in-person contact, very uh, needed, welcome, and appreciated. And right now it's real hard not to convey it's a lot that can be conveyed via phone call, via the duo or the FaceTime, but it's so much different than how they can feel your presence and know that their pastor truly is there for them. But the continued uh, follow-up, I would say, is what I try to do and I ask that each pastor does before anything, pray. Make sure that whatever part of this pastoral ministry, this pastoral care ministry that we're having to do during this pandemic, you bathe in prayer and that the spirit that rests on you and the spirit of God would also be conveyed to the one we're trying to minister. That through that ministry, they will feel like you both were in the same room at the same time. So when it comes to premarital counseling, when it comes to uh, counseling about uh, weddings, uh, counseling about just life, uh, coaching through, uh, it's through those mediums. But through funerals, uh, we are still doing the social distancing. Most funerals are done at funeral homes, and I think, uh, as it's been said, we do partnerships. Uh, I think we need to take cues from those who are having to uh, do ministry uh, that would normally be at the church at funeral homes and take those uh, those cues that they're giving. Uh, some funeral homes give tickets. Some funeral homes let you come in and view and there's a limited number of people who are already listed that can come to the funeral. Uh, those are some things that we've seen, but still I say know your context, pray over your context, and let God lead you in your what would you say that you are, if you have, or what are your plans to, to do to sanitize and sterilize your church campus? Uh, to sanitize, going back to the choir ministry, we've shifted uh, from having choir and we're moving more to a praise format, just worship leaders. Uh, we are getting gathering uh, two to three singers, maybe some background a little bit, uh, and each Sunday, uh, well, during the week, the church is sanitized. Sunday morning, the church is sanitized, and Sunday after, recorded worship is sanitized. So everybody does temperature checks, signs in, uh, sanitizes their hands. Uh, we got Lysol wipes. We got all those things to clean the mics. Uh, and those things. So there are certain uh, uh, sanitizing companies. I need to get one from Pastor Skinner that he's using. And I think if we can find African-American companies that are doing this work, that the African-American church should partner with these African-American uh, companies so that we can definitely turn our dollar over in our community and build a better uh, front as we come out of this pandemic. So those are the things that we're doing. But again, be prayerful about your context, know your context, and let God lead. This next question is now for Pastor Danny Hector of the New Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, as we know, throughout this pandemic, there has been uh, the rise in unemployment. Uh, people have um, been without jobs, so that means that they have been without money and uh, for an immature Christian who does not have money, they may not uh, 
trust God with their finances. Uh, so Pastor Hector, uh, do you have a plan for reducing expenses if the church's offerings don't rebound after this pandemic? Fortunately, by the grace of God, our contribution, our offering has not dwindled as of today. Um, we've learned um, that uh, those who would normally tithe and, and donate and contribute are, are being faithful. And um, of course, those that uh, come a quarter and give a quarter, those are still responding the same. And those that don't give, uh, in our discovery, they just don't give. And um, but thank thankful to God that our our um, contributions were still on target for our projected budget uh, for the year. Uh, but to answer your question, um, what we've gathered um, is, if need be, if the situation arises, uh, to temporarily um, uh, suspend our employers. I think we have five on the payroll uh, at this time, and they have all agreed, if necessary, uh, to take a, a temporary um, um, uh, uh, suspension of their payments, and they would still uh, work with us uh, if the need arises. And um, uh, secondly, uh, is suspen suspending employees' uh, payroll, um, as far as our uh, janitorial services and, and landscaping uh, services. Uh, we've already had in place a Tabitha team um, that in the event where we can't pay anybody uh, to clean our church, we simply ask for volunteers. And we named this volunteer team the Tabitha team. And um, uh, uh, thirdly, uh, if the need arises, I've already met with our trustees if the need arises, I have uh, asked them to, if the if you need to dig a little deeper uh, to meet the church's need, uh, would you do that? They have agreed uh, to that. And I'm under the opinion when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So these are some of the systems uh, that have really already been in place at our church before the pandemic. Um, but we plan to utilize it if uh, the necessity comes. But praise God and we give him the credit uh, our needs are being met fiscally and we thank God for that. As many pastors have already stated uh, most churches are using uh, YouTube and Facebook and free conference call and, and Zoom. Uh, would you say now that your church should be investing in new digital equipment or uh, technology to better serve your church? Um, this is one of our shortcomings. I will admit uh, at our church that we were not practicing before the pandemic in uh, live streaming our services, but um, this, this pandemic has propelled us into creating the uh, live streaming services. And um, uh, not only at this time are we uh, live streaming our worship services, Bible study and our children's church, but we plan um, to do a social virtual cafe because I'm noticing um, while we're worshiping via the World Wide Web, members are interacting with each other. Uh, I have a sense that they're missing each other. Uh, they miss being around each other as I miss being with the parishioners. And so we're going to formulate um, some type of virtual social media cafe to where members can interact and talk, update each other on how we're doing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But we, we have um, uh, purchased and, and ready to be installed um, uh, mounted uh, professional cameras, um, uh, mounted production uh, systems to con control these cameras, uh, with a keyboard and a joystick and a black mega mix BMD mini pro ADMI video production studio 
with all of this live streaming and uh you know and we 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 have purchased all this we plan to have all of this installed uh by this week we're also in the market uh, for studio booth and um, this is going to be the new norm we understand that and this is going to be a continual consistent uh, virtual worship at our church and we are meeting uh, the demands for that we have members and and the reason I say absolutely um, when the pandemic first hit Believe it or not, I have one elderly member still utilizes a rotary phone. And we have we have purchased, you know, phones, <laughs> cell phones for her. She she's just in that made up mind. I'm happy with my rotary phone. So of course, this is a member who I talk to every other day, see how she's doing. Uh, but uh, our seniors, we call them season saints. Our season saints are are joining in via teleconference. They're they're learning how to use their smartphone devices. So yes, absolutely, you do have to adapt to the times, and I'm I'm proud that we're doing that at our church. What would you say this pandemic has revealed about your formation as a church leader, and what opportunities are before you because of this? is punctuality. I could talk about uh, being more participatory as far as our streaming, our online worshiping. I could talk about professionalism or productivity or or even being persistent in our worship. But but to me, that revealed to me being more punctual as far as our timing. If you're going to present a time to social media, to the public. We want to start on time. If you have a projected time, you want to conclude uh, at that time. And and so um, just being persistent and punctual and then have some pay lucidity, uh, just being open and transparent uh, with your congregants. This is where we are. This is where we need to be. And um, But one of the things... Uh, when I say professionalism, I mean when you're on the World Wide Web, you kind of have to be careful <laughs> what you present over the pulpit. As if we were not on camera, uh, I'm guilty. Uh, pastors, brethren, uh, kind of saying some things that may be borderline out of order. But when you're on the World Wide Web, you have to make sure that you are professional at all times. Thank you for your question. We'll shift now to Pastor Derwin Earl Lewis of the Greater Oak Grove Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, Pastor Lewis, uh, this first question is, what, if, what would you say is God's preferred future for the life of the church for this new day to reach new people in a new way? Thank you, Jan. That, that's, uh, I think that's a very relevant question to what we're, we're dealing with now. But I think that it requires some background in terms of just the earthly ministry of Jesus. Uh, where I don't think that the pandemic, um, I don't, I don't think that it has, in, in a sense, created problems. I think it just kind of revealed to us where our issues are. Uh, caught in Malachi chapter one, uh, we see where the people had really, we see where the real spirituality of the of the Jews were. Um, and he got to the point to where he's saying, if, you, if you're so excited about what you give me, give it to your governor. And I think over these years, we have just given God anything and expect him to bless us anyhow. So Jesus comes on the scene, Matthew 16 and 18 says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so the whole ministry of Christ to me is about change. And so for us to really follow in that vein, then we should understand that change is relevant for us as a church. And I think it's no different here. Um, I, I'm, I'm just amazed sometimes at God's sovereignty that how he knew we were gonna be at this place way before we got here. And so for him to allow uh, those who have technolog- technological skills to be able to, fi- first of all, learn those skills, 
use those skills and then come in our church and now we're utilizing them. And, and so I think it's, it's all a blessing. Distance learning to me is really, uh, distance ministry rather, it's really a biblical process. Paul was in jail, but he wrote letters to churches everywhere else. Jesus employed John from the Isle of Patmos to write churches to the seven churches of Asia Minor. So what we're doing is, is according to Ecclesiastes, it's nothing new under the sun. And, and so I think that what we need to do is just continue uh, understanding the biblical process of why we're doing what we're doing and then use those skills in, in order to meet people. We, we, we've shared it over and over again in this setting about uh, you know the Zoom and the technology and all of those different things. And I think that uh, we just need to continue those things uh, that we're doing because we, we need to reach people. And sometimes uh, I think this pandemic has caused us to have a more reachability than we have in the past. He says to us, go ye therefore. And so we didn't go, so he made them come to us through the lines of technology. Uh, how, how would you say that all churches and even your local church can be a best service to serve your community during this crisis? Uh, that's, that's a good question as well. And I think that uh, my best response would be to look at Acts chapter one and eight when he says, you shall be witnesses unto me. And then he says, in Jerusalem, Judea, and then the uttermost parts of the world. And I think when we understand what our Jerusalem is, is that if, I, if God's goal for us is to be his witnesses, how can we better be a witness by understanding what the world is looking at when it looks at us? So in order for us to be a witness, we've got to be a witness first in our Jerusalem. Now, uh, Pastor Hector shared that we have to be careful what we say online, and so you guys may have to edit this out. But I think that if our Jerusalem is Shaded El Timbers for myself and Pastor Campbell, and you know Fifth Ward for Pastor Hector, and Northwood Manor for Barry, and you know on and on, I think that because we're all in the Houston area, then our witness has to be in our support in terms of what our local officials are saying. I think we're hypocritical if we say, if they're asking us to do one thing and then we do something else, because then we lose our witness and we confuse the people because there is power in the pulpit. We are very influential in what we say. And so I think that's the first thing that we have to do is make sure that we're doing what we need to do in being a witness to the community by them watching us, um, how we are respecting what the city officials are telling us to do in terms of social distance and all of the other things. Don't make it, don't make it, uh, I, I don't like the term over-spiritualize. I don't think you can over-spiritualize anything, but I think you can over-religialize things. You know, I'm a pastor, I, you know, I make words up, and so that's one of them. You can over-religialize uh, things. Thanks, <laughs> that's good. For those of you who have been listening uh, during this time, and you are a, a leader or a preacher, you're looking for a church home, I would not encourage you to uh, become a member of Pastor Campbell's church or uh, Pastor Lewis's church or Pastor Dinkinson's church because it sounds like they are very hard on their <laughs> leaders. Um, <laughs> amen. Amen. High, high expectations. Amen. Amen. Uh, shifting now to, to Pastor, Pastor Darren Moore of the True Vine of Spring Missionary Baptist Church. Pastor Lewis kind of spoke of this, but what would you say, uh, Pastor Moore, that your church might need to let go of? For example, what ministries were you not able, uh, have you not been able to do during this pandemic that you could continue to let lay fallow? Yeah, I think in a very real sense, uh, Pastor Lewis killed that question when he talked about um, if you haven't been able, to, if you haven't done it in four months, there's a good chance that there's let's need to go. I've never really been um, uh, a big fan of the auxiliary model because I grew up in a church where we tried to keep people relevant by uh, making them positional leaders, right? And we thought that we would engender loyalty. If I give you a title, I give you something, then that will make you loyal to me and we're just going to keep you busy. And what it did was um, it sucked the resources uh, from other things. You know, what, what, what they always tell us is that what you... Uh, what you feed grows and what you starve dies. And so right now what I've been doing is there's some things I've just been starving. 
um, and it's, it's intentional. Uh, there are some things that that uh, that do not uh, contribute to evangelism or to discipleship. They do not build up the body. Uh, they do not um, make us more um, outward community focused. So I have a ministry model that we rotate every three years, inward, outward, and upward. And if it doesn't fit in one of those buckets, um, I haven't been as long tenured as some of these uh, pastors are, but I've long tenured enough now to where some of the things I can do, uh, I don't get as much pushback. And so you made a statement in your introduction that you never waste a crisis. And I had a, I had a mentor in the professional world that told me that, and this has been the time where we've been kind of cleaning house. And so um, I have a, a, a kind of a vision board that I go through with my leaders and they have to make a pitch to me. Tell me in five minutes how this contributes to our upward, inward, or outward growth. And we slash it and burn it. Just like that. That's what we've been doing. Uh, pastor Skinner, uh, we have heard from every pastor who has kind of talked about some of the things that they've done outside of the box that's part of our new normal. Uh, what would you say or how will you continue some of your innovative ministries which started during the pandemic uh, into the time following it after we come out of this pandemic? Question, thank you. Uh, I, I've definitely learned that uh, I'm, I'm gonna park in my own zone, uh, meaning that uh, this is an age, and I think uh, one of the pastors mentioned it, where our millennials are uh, proving to, uh, to be a great asset to our church. So I'm, uh, I'm going to be much more proactive. We've got to be much more proactive in listening uh, to those persons that uh, I think Pastor Lewis alluded to it, that God knew that he was going to equip uh, for ministry for such a time as this. And so going forward, I think it's going to be important to uh, have much of an open ear. Uh, Pastor Moore just said it, that uh, it can't be so centralized on us as pastors, uh, we have to be willing to, uh, to delegate more. We're going to have to be willing uh, to uh, utilize the resources that we are privy to right now and even beyond, as I said, the pandemic. Uh, one of the things that happened in our, at our church, which was quite unique, one of them, we started the services. Uh, we uh, had our, we built it on a conference call, the conference call. And uh, one morning we get, get on fairly early. I turned it on, must have been about 8.30, something like that. We started our service at 9. And there was a gentleman on there who had not been attending church for quite a while. But the fact that people just heard his voice, they got excited about the fact yeah. that Brother Callahan is on the line. They hadn't been able to see him, hadn't been able to talk to him. So these things are showing that these are things that we've got to do way beyond. We've got to be a part of our, our regular ongoing ministry uh, for, uh, for those who sometimes who can't do it. Uh, we can't worry about those who who not going to come because we're doing it. You know, that's up between them and the Lord. Uh, uh, the Bible clearly says that we're all accountable to him for everything that we do for ourselves in this body, whether it's good or bad. Uh, so for those who choose to, you know, joke around and play around and, and use it as a way of complacency and laziness, can't control that. Uh, but for those persons that uh, have not been able to be a part of ministry, it's going to be a wonderful way of us uh, being able to get to engage with them in some, um, some wonderful ways. Because of our mobility now, uh, we're recognizing because uh, so much time that people have with uh, with the children in school, homework, all of those things that they have to do. Uh, we have ways now of still be able to communicate the word of God, eliminating the excuses that we can sometimes offer, uh, making sure that some things are pre-recorded and the like, but always making sure you have an opportunity to be exposed. Because one of the things that this thing has really done, it has eliminated excuses to say, I don't have a chance to study, I don't have a chance to... I didn't get a chance to go to Bible study. Man, you get more Bible study than you ever have now. So this thing going forward is showing to us, you know, so I'm grateful again for, for Zacchaeus. I'm grateful for uh, uh, what he has done in helping us to be more established as it relates to uh, being able to, uh, 
do what we need to do to get the word going forward even beyond this pandemic. What programs or ministry have been halted or halted or stopped, which can only be conceivably conducted in person? I guess in our case, it will probably be more the, the interaction, first of all, from a standpoint of evangelism, the door-to-door uh, ministry that we, uh, that we do on a, you know, a, a monthly basis, going from house to house, whether it's city gas or whether it's in the apartment complexes where we, uh, we used to frequenting, uh, we've had to halt that because, again, of the, those social distancing issues that you're dealing with. Bottom line is people just don't come to the door. They don't know you. So that has, we've been affected in that sense uh, as, it, uh, as it relates to our evangelism. I guess the only other thing would be the uh, uh, ministry for us, the meeting, the one-on-one meetings with our seniors uh, in terms of the interactions that they have done with each other because, you know, the bottom line is, uh, I think all of us would agree, uh, this whole thing with our seniors is not a problem about them staying home and, you know, they, they doing their part. They are not, they are not coming out and they're not letting you come in, you know. So that, in that sense of that's kind of that more intimate, uh, you know, Pastor uh, uh, Dinkins mentioned that, kind of that more one-on-one thing that we're able to do more personally with them uh, uh, for, for all intents and purposes. That's the only thing that has really uh, been halted, you know, but we're still going to the whole idea of um, uh, uh, just sharing this. One of the things that I've been doing is, uh, especially for our elders, I, um, I just, I pull up at the house, I stand on the street wherever I can and just talk to them to say, hey, look, we miss y'all. Look forward to seeing y'all. And that just does them the world of good. Just the fact that Pastor came by just to look at me, to see me, just to know that I was doing okay. So as I said, though, those, a lot of things have been halted. God has now stretched us to find some o- innovative ways uh, to uh, uh, gain that intimacy that uh, Dr. David Dinkins talked about that we have lost. And so, uh, but that would be the only two that I would, I, definitely the evangelism door to door we're still able again to, to reach others, uh, you know, just in the marketplace, you know, with our, our the best way that we can in sharing Christ. Yeah. Uh, I think we learned uh, that not only does Pastor Hector, uh, he's, a, he's a bivocational pastor, but it sounds like he's also a technology major um, as he's talking about some of the investments that they've made to their, their technology department. Um, thinking about the long term, since it sounds like some most pastors have mentioned that uh, with what we do online now this will be something that we have to do for the foreseeable future Uh, Pastor Skinner would you say or what would you say is your is your infrastructure for offering online engagement gonna be for the long term amen Uh, uh, my my pastor Emil Thomas is uh, going to be with the Lord now before he uh made a transition as far as from senior pastor and he put other or other he retired two other pastors uh, uh, served those churches that he served in Louisiana what he did long before they started is that uh, things that he knew were going to need to be put in place he actually put them in place ahead of time because he didn't want those younger pastors to have the struggle and fight and you know uh, uh, be able to uh, not being the ability uh, the, in the place to be able to uh, serve that congregations, knowing that uh, almost prophetically that these things that we're sp- experiencing right now are, are things that he saw in the future that were going to be needed. Uh, and so he set up the churches with the videos, with the cameras. He did all of those things that he needed to do prior to his retirement so that they would be ready. Uh, listen, uh, this past Tuesday night, met with our deacons and we were talking about what we need to do uh, with the cameras. I'm not going to try to do what Pastor Hector did, trying to give you that fancy name, all of that stuff he did. All I know is that we were looking to invest in a better camera than what we had. And uh, 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 those those older brothers were there and kind of thinking in my mind, I'm not sure how this is going to go. But before, before Zacchaeus could finish his presentation, they say, hey, how long is it going to take to get that? Go ahead and get it now. <laughs> because we're recognizing that this is, this is where God has us. These are the things that we need to be investing in. 
Um, some of you have said it, or I think uh, Pastor Darren Moore and some others have actually dealt with the issue of that last three or four months, there's some things that we're finding out we don't need anymore. But we are discovering that these are things that we need from an innovative standpoint as far as the technologies and the like are concerned. And the thing that we're finding out too, and I definitely want to encourage uh, those of us who are listening, is that it, it is not as expensive sometimes as we think it would be. Uh, but if, we're not, if we don't open our mind up to the possibility that we could do these things, then uh, that's what it makes it more difficult. So going forward, we're, we're putting things in place right now as far as uh, using Zoom, using uh, the, uh, the multimedia technology in terms of being able to contact many people at one time, uh, using the telephone to be able to do those kinds of things, and our congregation, even though, as you said, five generational, everybody's adapting to it. Everybody's coming alongside. Everybody is, is ingratiating themselves to it because we are convinced this is where God has us for right now. And, as I said, going forward, it's going to be what's going to be needed for us to be able to do ministry effectively. You know, one thing that Jesus did, Jesus had the same message, but he had a lot of different methods. And all we're learning now is this is a different method of getting the same message across that he, he does live, he did die, he was resurrected, he went back to the Father, and he's coming back again. And so the message is just being conveyed in a different way. Amen. Uh, thank you, Pastor Skinner. That is my pastor. Uh, this is a this is a throw out question, so anyone can can grab this one. Um, thinking about the members, as Pastor uh, Pastor Skinner said, um, how they are aren't able to connect with one another. Uh, pastors, what would you say? Can we intentionally do to connect with people as as lay members, and how can you encourage uh, your members to connect with others without putting them at risk? Monday through Saturday, we do our snap, and I get on at twelve. I try to give them at least two to three minutes because we can't all get on at the same time. But I'm always interrupting a major conversation on our prayer line with our seniors that they're having. And, and so now I'm, I'm looking to encourage them, use that prayer line. It's 24 hours a day. Man, during vacation, Bob, and by the way, we, we had to do this in vacation Bible school. I didn't, I didn't fail to mention that. We did, had a successful vacation Bible school during this pandemic. And it was because I stepped out of the way, let our director put our persons in place, and they did it age appropriately. And it was a success, but with our seniors, Man, they did their class on that prayer line because some of them don't have technology skills and that type of thing. But, man, I'm encouraging them. Hey, man, let's go in overtime. Let's go in the overflow. Maybe we create some more subject matter, not just the subject matter we use for vacation Bible school, but let's give them that opportunity to continue on. Uh -huh. They ask, Pastor, you're not going to take vacation month, you know, from it? I'm scared to stop, man, because this is a lifeline for some of them. You know, so we're encouraging them. Man. We're encouraging them to keep keep it going. Keep that communication going with each other. However they communicate. Thank you. Even before or after uh, our weekly prayer call, uh, the, the members stay on the line. Yeah. I, I hang up because I'm, I'm bivocational. But I, I'm told that they're on the line for at least another hour <laughs> because they, they miss that intimacy. So... Um, um, I, I'm glad to hear it from the other brothers as well that their members are, are missing that intimacy as well and, and we plan uh, I hope to get with you guys so I can get a, a sense of direction on where we need to go to formulate some type of uh, me, social media virtual cafe or something where they can just talk, catch up and uh, I miss them, they miss me and, and they miss each other and so we we would encourage this. We would encourage this dialogue. Reverend Skinner, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm happy we got together, but now my congregation gonna see where I get a lot of my ideas from. They, they probably thought, oh, Pastor spending a whole lot of time with God and God just blessing him, but it's because I hang out with these guys. 
and we share ideas and we refine our ideas and this is a blessing man and I, I'm seriously going to be calling trying to get on you all's calendar about several things that I've jotted down here that you made comments about because man I want our church to be proficient in every area we attempt to serve in man. and I'm, I'm grateful just to hear what you all are doing this has been wonderful for me yes it has I, I've got one question, uh, uh, Jam. Just, just from our perspective, you've heard us as pastors, but can you just share with us from your generation what is it that you would uh, see the need? What what need do you guys have? Um, you know, through this pandemic, from from us senior pastors. Um, so my my thought process is a little bit different in regards to uh, most millennials. I was I was raised in church. Um, so I am of the thought of my pastor and what he said that we uh, as millennials right now don't have any excuse. Um, a lot of pastors are stretching themselves and reaching and doing things outside of the box. I know of a lot of older seasoned senior pastors, if you will, who are now using uh, technology. And that's all that we have right now. Uh, as far as millennials are concerned, we use technology for social media, for movies, for uh, pretty much everything that we do right now is online. Um, so for any pastor who's, who's reached out and uh, given those opportunities for service, uh, we appreciate them. Uh, I would say that that would be the only thing that a pastor would now just reach out to those millennials, reach out to them and ask them, what can we do to get this word out to uh, the entire world because your audience is greater now. Uh, some of them, as you guys have already mentioned, some of them will voluntarily offer up their services. Others are going to be lazy, but I think it is the responsibility and duty of the pastor uh, to at least reach out, uh, impart the wisdom, encourage them, and allow them the opportunity uh, to serve in the areas that God has gifted them in. So, yeah, give those millennials an opportunity. You know, what, what you want people to know about your church and how your church looks, put, that, put those people on the stage. And it works for us. Amen. I'm sure the audience has heard us say Reverend Skinner, some have said Stefan, some have said Jeff. He all that. And uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I thank you, man. Seriously. Great job. Now. Great I job. thank you for hosting the way you have. Wonderful job, uh, great ideas, man, great questions. and uh, Man, we're we, we going to be calling on you to listen some more, man. I'm serious because I think you're a great voice from your generation, and you're going to be an even greater voice yeah, in, in, in God's timing. And I appreciate your humility, man. I'm serious. So we'll be listening, man. If there's some stuff that you've heard that you want, man, you open to all of us. And we want to be open to you, too, because yes. I think you got some stuff that you can offer to us. Them questions were exceptional, man, and yes, I appreciate that. Yes. I'm serious. I appreciate that. Anybody else? Uh, a couple of months ago, a few months ago, I was thinking one of the, one of the pastors, we were meeting at uh, Forest Brook, and uh, they were saying, man, Skinner, y'all really, or you really know what you're doing that, uh, with that uh, online stuff, man. You're doing a good job, bro. I say, I say, you think so, man? He said, yeah. I say, I say, man, you know what? I walk in the place and I say, why y'all want me to stand? <laughs> I say, that is about the extreme nature of how well I'm doing. So what I'm saying is, we're grateful to God, as I said, for Zacchaeus Quinney, again, who's over our media ministry, uh, for Stefan Skinner, who they have pushed this old dude. Uh, yeah, he's 61 years old. They pushed me into uh, an area that I in a sense, kind of was pushing back from uh, for a while. So I just want to encourage all of us uh, and the elder pastors that may be listening to this at any point, uh, we have to do this. And all we need to do is to turn it over to this generation yes. that God has given these abilities to for such a time as this. Yes. God, we thank you so much for this meeting of the minds and thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what will be gleaned even beyond this time by our members and others who will view and review this again and again. 
We pray that what was said and done was decent and in order and acceptable in your sight. Yes. We pray that it stretch and encourage ministries all over mm -hmm. that we'll be a better people and we'll reach more people for our Christ. It's in his name we love you and Jesus thank you. Name. We bless you and praise you. We do pray. Amen.